All the planet's forests are in danger. In this program, we'll be talking about two of the scourges that plague them, fires and epidemics. We will also learn that in his attempts at reforestation, man has found himself a new ally, genetics. In 1988, there were over 30,000 forest fires in the United States alone. They destroyed 3.7 million acres of timberland. Half of one of the largest national parks in North America, Yellowstone Park, was laid waste by flames. The experts decided to let the fires burn freely without trying to extinguish them. Not through negligence or by being fatalistic, they simply wanted to let the fire play its ecological role. Fire is now considered a natural part of the cycle of forest renewal. Almost everywhere in the world, selective and controlled burning is becoming a normal treatment for forests. It has proven to be an excellent way to clear areas overridden with bush and deadwood before planting new trees. The fact that the firemen are now playing with fire by no way means they have given up their traditional role. The prevention and control of forest fires remain their true vocation. It is difficult to list all the good things the forests give us. They house us, provide the oxygen we breathe, temper climates. But this thin film of life, which covers a third of the land on our planet, is fragile. An enemy lies in wait for it, fire. A number of countries have declared veritable war on forest fires. The fight mobilizes a great many resources, human and material. But their efforts are often not enough. It only takes a small fire a few hours to rage out of control. Fires such as these are only put out by rain, or when their fuel, the trees, runs out. In other words, once the forest has been completely destroyed. So we resort to another approach, detect the enemy before it shows itself. Researchers have created a computer system that enables them to anticipate fires and fight them in their earliest possible stages. The system involves a network of specialized fire centers scattered throughout the territory. These centers, veritable firefighting headquarters, receive all sorts of data related to the condition of the forest. Specialists sift through all the data for clues to a possible fire. Weather conditions provide the most revealing clues. As a rule, forest fires are caused by the combustible materials on the forest floor. The drier that surface layer is, the more likely it is to catch fire. These natural fuels and their degree of dryness are closely monitored. Twice daily, thanks to weather stations located all over the territory, data is collected on the relative humidity, wind speed and direction, temperature and precipitation. Other clues can point to a fire in a specific location. For instance, a quarter of all forest fires are ignited by lightning. When lightning strikes a tree, it goes to its very roots. It can therefore ignite the thick layer of humus on the ground. And this can lead to a forest fire of devastating proportions. To help fight such fires, lightning detectors are installed at all points of the forest. These devices are able to detect and pinpoint a spot where lightning has struck hundreds of kilometers away. However, the main cause of forest fires is human activity. It accounts for three quarters of them. Thus, the presence of humans is monitored at all points on a regular basis. When the risk of fire is too great, access to the forest may be restricted or even barred. The people in charge of fighting forest fires use computers to analyze and compare all the clues. If they consider the risk of forest fire to be critical, they call on the air patrols. In small planes, the patrolmen fly over the risk zones up to four times. 
If they spot a fire, they immediately notify their headquarters of its location. The preparations for action get underway. The firefighters set out. The first to arrive on the scene is the air attack boss. He flies over the fire constantly in a twin-engine plane, reporting back to headquarters. Within an hour, a first ground attack crew moves in by truck, helicopter, or plane. While the ground crew sets up, the air tankers launch an attack. Maneuvering from a body of water located near the fire, these water bombers swoop down and barely skimming the surface, fill up their tanks. It takes them roughly 10 seconds to fill their 5,400 liter tanks. Under the close supervision of the air attack boss, the tankers release their cargo over the blazing woodland. The air tankers do little more than calm a raging fire. The job of putting it out devolves to the ground crew. Armed with shovels, motorized pumps, and mechanical rams, the firefighters turn over the soil and build a fire break to prevent the blaze from spreading. The success of the battle depends largely on the level of communication between the firefighters. Thanks to the air attack boss, headquarters follows their progress and feeds them instructions. Using the computer, the fire boss can even predict the speed and direction of a fire. Because they are so well coordinated, the firefighters can put most fires out within a day. Results of this new system of forest fire prevention and combat have been positive. In areas where it has been implemented, the surface of forests ravaged by flames has been reduced by half. We will probably never be able to eliminate forest fires completely, but thanks to new prevention techniques, they will gradually drop both in number and intensity. In a few years, the fight against forest fires will be waged with the help of veritable squadrons of flying extinguishers. Tomorrow's planes will operate similarly to the fire extinguishers we have in our homes. They will spray a foam over burning forests, which will form a protective shield around the fire's hot spot. The circular shield will keep the fire from spreading and protect surrounding vegetation. Odorless, non-toxic, and biodegradable. However, our green capital faces another threat, devastating insect epidemics. A forest is home to numerous living organisms. They all depend on its resources, but only use a small portion of them. So the two live in a harmonious balance which allows the forest to thrive. But occasionally, one of its inhabitants takes more than its share and upsets the balance. The spruce bud moth, commonly referred to as the budworm, for example, inhabits the coniferous forests of eastern North America. Its life cycle resembles that of many other insects. At the end of summer, the adult moth lays its eggs on the needles of various species of evergreens. Come spring, the caterpillars grow, devouring the budding growth. Then the caterpillars change into chrysalids. The moths emerge and a new cycle begins. As a rule, the spruce bud moth is prey to natural enemies who live off it or as parasites deposit their eggs on it. For reasons that remain unknown, bud moths sometimes multiply at alarming rates. They become an epidemic. Budworms gorge themselves on spruce needles, weakening the trees and actually killing the forest. Population explosions of this kind have long been common in the bud moth. These natural catastrophes are very costly to the forestry industry. To counter their impact, an arsenal of measures has been deployed. For a number of years, chemical insecticides provided the vital front line. These powerful weapons have saved the life of many a woodland. But chemical insecticides have major disadvantages. They kill insects indiscriminately, thereby depriving birds and fish of food. They are harmful to the environment, 
And in time, species of insects immune to these chemicals emerge and proliferate. Today, it is prohibited to use chemical insecticides over most of Canada's forests. Solutions based on a natural enemy of the pests, the Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT, have replaced chemical insecticides in those areas where the budworm infestation persists. BT is a bacteria that produces microscopic crystals composed of BT toxin, a protein harmful to certain insects. When they ingest the protein, it paralyzes their oral parts and they cease to eat. The protein also destroys the walls of their digestive tubes. Unlike chemical insecticides, BT is very selective. The colonies used will only kill Lepidopterus larvae, that is, butterfly and moth larvae. Scientists are also exploring other ways to put an end to bud moth epidemics. In nature, there exists a virus that causes a fatal infection in the bud moth. The treatment tested consists of spreading the disease in areas where the larvae threaten the forest. First, the virus is isolated from among naturally infested larvae. It is then introduced into a bud moth colony to multiply. Using contaminated insects, a suspension containing a heavy concentration of the virus is prepared. This suspension is then sprayed on the trees. When they feed, the larvae ingest the virus which begins to multiply. Since the insects have no immune system to fight the infection, they die a few days later. Experts in biotechnology are trying to make the virus even more effective by injecting the BT gene, which produces the BT toxin protein, into the moth's genetic material. However, insecticide spraying is expensive, and it is not possible to spray all forest land, some part being totally inaccessible. That's why scientists are looking for other means to control the reproduction rates of the spruce bud moth, means that would enable them to manipulate the pest's instinctive behavior, using, for instance, pheromones. Pheromones are the chemical substances secreted by female butterflies to notify the males they are ready for mating. By saturating the atmosphere with pheromones, the males might be confused. They would be unable to locate the females in order to fertilize them. Sexual pheromones have already proven successful to keep bud moth populations under control. A pheromone trap was developed. Attached to the lid is a tablet from which the pheromone is emitted and then carried by the wind. Males who respond to the chemical beckoning are trapped. Hundreds of these traps are scattered all over North America's forest just before the butterfly and moth mating season. Based on scientific mathematical models, according to the number of male butterflies captured, scientists are able to determine the quantities of larvae in the forests. By detecting the warning signs of an epidemic in a given region, it will be easier to avert excessive proliferation of the bud moth. When we know more about insects, biological warfare against pests will become a real possibility. Experience has taught us that it is useless to try to free the forests of harmful insects entirely. Rather, we will have to learn to live with them. Just as insects are part of the forest ecosystem, trees are part of the world macrosystem. It's not surprising that reforestation is becoming increasingly popular throughout the world. When it comes to reforestation, though, agronomists and forestry engineers are not the only people involved. Part of the work, research, is conducted in laboratories, and part is incumbent upon geneticists. Planting trees used to be done for purely aesthetic reasons, but today it has become a vital necessity. The vast timberland laid waste by an avid forestry industry is not easily replanted. Commercially valueless vegetation left standing when the trees were cut grows up over the land and prevents the desired species of trees from growing. It can take decades for a healthy forest to grow back over the exploited area. To help forests regenerate, 
Millions of seedlings of commercial species must be planted, but many of them never reach maturity. Often planted in thin topsoil, poor in nutritive elements, the saplings weaken. Many succumb to the cold, to insects, or are smothered by other plants that take the space and light they require to grow. In their attempts to improve the quality of new forests, scientists have been trying for years to improve the genetic potential of the trees used for reforestation. They focus on the tree's growth rate, resistance to insects and disease, adaptation to various climatic conditions, and even to acid rain. A species is genetically improved by first taking samples of the best tree specimens that grow in the wild. Their seeds constitute a reservoir of genes on which improvements can be made. The seeds thus collected are planted and submitted to various conditions of growth. After a few years, the experts are able to determine which species possess the best genetic potential. Then the selected species are specially cultivated. To speed up the development and multiplication process, transplants are taken from the trees and fastened to stalks. This will produce clones, that is, several dozen identical copies of each of the subjects selected. In the wild, evergreens generally produce few seeds, except when they must ensure their own survival following a season of particularly adverse weather. The trees are then subjected to various types of stress, their stems and roots are cut back. They are watered less frequently. The ambient temperature is raised. The trees respond by blossoming abundantly. Hormone treatments force the clones to produce flowers. Either sprayed or inoculated, the hormones are chemical messengers that alter the biological clock of plant cells. They stimulate the production of flowers rather than the development of leaves. During blossoming, the flowers are bagged to prevent them from being accidentally pollinated. First, the pollen is collected on the male flowers. It will be used to pollinate the tree's female flowers, which have other genetic qualities. Crosses are made to measure to emphasize specific genetic qualities. For example, a fast-growing white spruce might be crossed with another type that is more resistant to the cold. The flowers will continue to grow until they reach maturity when they produce seed-carrying cones. Thus, improved varieties are created, which in turn will be evaluated, multiplied, and crossed. The process is repeated until increasingly promising trees are obtained. At the end of each cycle, the best specimens are transplanted into seed orchards. These orchards produce the seeds required for reforestation. Biotechnology has vastly accelerated the means of improving the genetic qualities of various species of trees. In vitro cultivation, for instance, makes it possible to multiply a variety of trees much more quickly than the usual seed production method. In vitro cultivation is done, starting from the embryo hidden inside the seeds of evergreens. It is placed on a culture medium containing a specific combination of hormones and nutritive substances. This environment provides the conditions the plant cells need to develop into a cluster of identical embryos. Each embryo is then isolated and returned to the culture medium. In a few weeks, thousands of clones are produced. The embryos can then be sewed normally, but they could also be inserted into an agar capsule, which would serve as a germination environment. Once scientists have perfected this technique, reforestation will be easier, since the embryos may be either stored or transplanted right away. Crosses between various varieties of trees of the same species have enhanced the natural qualities of the species. Genetic engineering enables scientists to create hybrids that could not be obtained naturally. One technique consists of fusioning in a special solution cells from a white pine, for example, and those of an exotic variety capable of resisting diseases that affect the white pine. Using these manipulated cells, scientists can create a first embryo, then make thousands of copies of it in vitro.
tree genetics compared to crop genetics is still little known. But the more society recognizes the wealth our forests represent, the greater we will try to preserve and restore them. Black spruce yields the best newspaper in the world. Teak is coveted for cabinet making. Fir trees for making bolts. As for this violin, it's probably made of maple and spruce wood. It is usually high altitude regions that yield the valuable timber used to make these incomparable sound instruments.